From the early days of the Roman Republic through the volatile reigns of such ignoble emperors as Caligula and Commodus, the Imperium Romanum continued to expand, stretching its borders to encompass the entire Mediterranean Sea as well as expanding northward to Gallia and Britannia. History records the exploits of the heroes as well as the tirades of the emperors. Despite the sometimes shameful deeds of the imperial office, the empire was built on the backs of its citizens, the unsung people who lived a relatively quiet existence, and who are often ignored by history. Rome was a cosmopolitan city with many different ethnicities and like any society, the average Roman citizen awoke each morning, labored, relaxed, and ate. I would like to show you how the daily life of the Roman citizen looked like and what activities were common during these times. Let's get started. Population Movements Outside the cities, in the towns and on the small farms, people lived a much simpler life, dependent almost entirely on their own labor. The daily life of the average city dweller, however, was a lot different and most often routine. The urban areas of the empire, whether it was Rome, Pompeii, Antioch, or Carthage, were magnets to many people who left smaller towns and farms seeking a better way of life. However, the unfulfilled promise of jobs forced countless people to live in the poorer parts of the city. The jobs they sought were often not there, resulting in an epidemic of homeless inhabitants. The work that was available to these new emigres, however, was difficult to obtain. Slaves performed almost all of the menial jobs as well as many of the professions such as teachers, doctors, surgeons, and architects. Most of the freedmen worked at various trades, for example, as bakers, fishmongers, or carpenters. Occasionally, poor women would serve the affluent as hairdressers, midwives, or dressmakers. Housing As elsewhere, whether on a farm or in the city, daily life still centered on the home, and when people arrived in the city, their first concern was to find a place to live. Space was at a premium in a walled metropolis like Rome, and from the beginning little attention was paid to the housing needs of the people who migrated to the city, tenements provided the best answer. The majority of Roman citizens lived in the insulate ancient block of flats. As early as 150 BCE, there were over 46,000 insulae throughout the city. Most of these ramshackle tenements were overcrowded and extremely dangerous resulting in residents living in constant fear of fire, collapse, and in some areas there was the susceptibility to the flooding of the Tiber River. Initially, little concern from the city was given to designing straight or even wide streets, not allowing for easy access to these buildings if a fire did occur. These flats were usually over 70 feet however, because many of these tenements were deemed unsafe, laws were passed under emperors Augustus and Trajan to keep them from becoming too tall, unfortunately, these laws were rarely enforced. Summing up the comfort of life in the insulae, depended on the place where it was built, as well as the floor on which you live, and basically luck which would allow you to avoid fire. Private Villas on the contrary, most of the wealthy residents, those who didn't live in villas outside the city, lived in a domus. These homes, at least in Rome, were usually located on Palatine Hill to be close to the imperial palace. As with many of the tenements, the front of this dwelling often contained a shop where the owner would conduct daily business. Behind the shop was the atrium a reception area where guests or clients were greeted and private business sometimes conducted. The atrium would often include a small shrine to a household or ancestral god. The ceiling of the atrium was open and beneath this was a rectangular pool. On rainy days the water that came through this opening was collected and used elsewhere in the domus. On either side of the atrium were smaller rooms, called cubiculum which served as bedrooms, libraries and offices. Of course, there was ample space available for a dining room or triclinium and the kitchen. To the rear of the domus was the family garden. Food. Everyone has to eat, 
and the diet of a Roman resident depended, as did his or her housing, on one's economic status. For many of the poor this meant waiting for the monthly allotment of grain. To most Romans the main meal of the day was in the late afternoon, from 4 to 6. The morning and noon meals were usually light snacks, sometimes only bread. Since there was no refrigeration, shopping was done daily at the many small shops and street carts or in the city's forum. Many of the foods we consider Italian today did not exist in early Rome. There were no potatoes, tomatoes, corn, peppers, rice, or sugar. Neither were there any oranges, grapefruits, apricots, or peaches. While the wealthy enjoyed imported spices in their meals, reclined on pillows and were served by slaves, many of the extremely poor or homeless ate rancid cereal or gruel. To others the daily diet consisted of cereals, bread, vegetables and olive oil. Meat was far too expensive for the average budget although it sometimes became available after a sacrifice to the gods. Wine was the common drink, but, for the poor, water was available at the public fountains. Work and leisure. For the affluent the day was divided between business and leisure. Of course, business was only conducted in the morning. Most Romans worked a six-hour day, beginning at dawn and ending at noon, although, occasionally some shops might reopen in the early evening. The city's forum would be empty because the afternoon was devoted to leisure, attending the games, such as, gladiatorial competitions, chariot races, or wrestling, the theater or the baths, all of which were also enjoyed by the poor. Even during times of crises, the citizens of Rome were kept happy with bread and games. They could be found at the Circus Maximus, Colosseum, or Theater of Pompeii. In conclusion, daily life in a Roman city was completely dependent on one's economic status. The city, however, remained a mixture of wealth and poverty, often existing side by side. The wealthy had the benefit of slave labor whether it was heating the water at the baths, serving them their evening meal, or educating their children. The poor, on the other hand, had no access to education, lived in rundown tenements, and sometimes lived off the charity of the city. If you liked the video, remember to leave a like and subscribe. This was History Revamped, to the next video.